Good morning. I'm Julia, and I'm John lets me occasionally speak from up here. He might be right this. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> so thank you for this reading. I beautifully read our uh, preaching text for today. I wonder what went through your head when you heard this story. If we had more time, I would ask you to get your mobile out and to create a little word cloud in the background because I think that it's really great to tell me your first thoughts of this story, but I don't really want to stretch the service too long. <laughs> so I will just tell you what I thought. When I hear this story, I'm really struggling because my first thoughts are, what if this happened nowadays? What if this was a newspaper article that we are reading then? It might well be. Being in London, it is actually not too long ago that we read things like this in the newspaper. Somebody offering their child in a ritual, religious ritual, and killing them in this process. This happens still nowadays, and it is happening not so often in London, thank goodness, but it does happen in Uganda and India, and sometimes here. There's even trafficking going on with children for these purposes. Who of you reads this type of news of this and it and thinks, wow, that's a great guy. This man really trusted his God. That's a really obedient father who went through and believed what God was telling him and did this. Anybody who would think that reading this in the news? Probably not. I wouldn't be the one. So, I knew for a while that I was had to talk about this text, and I had this real struggle about this thing, thinking like, why do we get handed Abraham here as somebody we should look up to, as a role model, while at the same time we would condemn the very same thing as what's happening today? I'm not sure I'm getting a full answer to that. So some might, I try to anticipate what he would tell me if I'd ask you this question, well, some might argue, well, Isaac survived at the end, so that wouldn't really get all the way to the big news, probably, because Isaac actually walked out alive from there. But I'm not sure that's really the point, because Abraham was willing to sacrifice him. And I'm not sure about you, but I personally would find this a little bit disturbing if my father would have been willing to sacrifice me somewhere. That would seriously uh, hurt my trust into my father. Uh, love to me. So, the fact that Isaac survived is not necessarily down to the fact that Abraham wasn't listening to God. <clears throat> or you might say, oh, this happened a long time ago, and we always can't really translate things that happened about 4,000 years ago into what happening nowadays. But child sacrifices, although more common back then, are not really the norm in Judaism. And they haven't been really like a thing to do back then either. <clears throat> so I think child sacrifices were always sort of the final straw, the exception to the rule. So that is exactly not really explaining why we take Abraham as a role model and wouldn't really apply the same rules to somebody who's doing this nowadays. Another thought while listening to the story is that. Did Abraham know that he didn't have to try, that he didn't have to kill Isaac at the end? Because if he really trusted God that deeply, he probably thought nothing will happen to Isaac, Isaac my son, because I'm trusting God <clears throat> to be the good God and to want the best for everybody. And there were various promises on Isaac's shoulder already beforehand. And in the story, it actually says, he, he tells the other people, we will come back down, and he tells Isaac on the way up, God will provide, so don't worry about the lamb. But again, I'm not entirely sure if that's the point of the story either, because that kind of makes it all uh, go round in circles. If God is testing Abraham, but Abraham kind of knows, oh, you're not going through this anyway, so therefore, <laughs> it's not a real test as such. It's a tricky story, at least for me. You might see it in a different way. So why do we wear horrified when somebody nowadays would tell us, I heard God's voice and I sacrificed my child, and we feel less horrified about Abraham as a role model? I find the Old Testament very often a challenge. 
I find it often hard to reconcile what the, the God, the way God is described in the Old Testament, what I would like to believe about God's character. He is a very, uh, he is a God who's testing his people very uh, obviously. He is a God who's punishing people. He is a God who's very cruel to his enemies. There are lots of cruel stories in the Old Testament. So therefore I'd like to put that aside and concentrate on the New Testament myself. Only today I wasn't allowed to because I have to talk about an Old Testament text. So back to Abraham. I feel John getting a bit nervous now that I'm not taking the right <laughs> way because I have my title up there. Trusting God really is the subject of today. Putting child sacrifices on one side talked enough about that, and let's turn to the whole issue of trusting God. Who was Abraham? A little bit of background to him. Abraham, which actually translated means the father of many nations, is exactly that, he is the father of many nations, he is one of the first Hebrew patriots, and has, is actually playing a role, and I didn't know that before today, in, both, in, in all three of the big religions, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So he's a really big figure, he's a cornerstone. Abraham was asked by God to leave his native place and move on to find a promised land which he didn't know why he was moving around. And he obeyed God without questioning. He got up and left and moved on to this promised land. As you all know, Abraham didn't have a son until very late. He had the son out of wedlock, not with his wife, but with another woman. But his son Isaac, who he got with his wife Sarah, uh, he got very late in life. So again, that's a example, another example of trusting God. It was a very long road for this, and Abraham did question this length of waiting time. But it did happen in the end. So he had lots of proof from God about God being on his side and delivering on his promises. So in Christianity, Jesus' uh, genealogy can be traced back all the way to Abraham, uh, all the way to Isaac and Abraham. And in Islam, the prophet Muhammad is being traced back to the other son of uh, Abraham, who was born with the other lady that he went out with, Hagar, that out of wedlock. So Abraham is the center figure for all three big religions. And in our text, God is asking Abraham to part with what is most precious to him, his son. And Abraham gets to be the good guy in this story. Why? So three other thoughts apart from child sacrifices. There's a lot in this text. One could take for a long time about this. It's a long text as well. <clears throat> Maybe Abraham gets to be the good guy because he accepts God's supremacy. I think this is one of the central pieces in this text. God is reminding Abraham of putting God first. God is above everything. And this conflicts a bit with our culture, I find, because in our culture, well, we have, very often we have money on top of our pyramid, but also family. Family values are held very high in our culture. Family is very often put above everything. But this is not completely in line with the Bible, even though in church we quite often hear about the value of family links. And I don't want in any way trying to tell you that family is not important. But the point of this story is what is more important. What is above everything else. So Jesus said, for example, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. This is strong. This is really tough, I find. Again, one of those things that I like to gloss over a little bit because it doesn't quite sit right with me. But choosing God means God has to come first. It's God after all we talk about. It's not another friend of ours, another relation. 
that the occasion he converted is God. It's a big one. And this big one needs to come before everything else. There's a high supremacy in here. So choosing God means doing this without any ifs and buts. And this is what Jesus did as well when he asked his disciples to follow him. I often wondered what I would have done if I had been asked. It can't have been an easy decision. They were asked to leave their life, all the lives that they knew, that probably their families. If their wife traveled with them, we don't quite know, or at least I don't quite know. But the rest of the family certainly didn't. They couldn't take their entire family with them. So these people got up and left everything behind. Again, how would we judge somebody today if they walk out from their family to follow somebody on the rich, religious grounds? It's not quite where we would say, oh, well done. You were really courageous. The disciples did that, and Jesus, Jesus demands that <coughs> from them. So sometimes I wonder if we become too complacent, too comfortable, somewhat of armchair Christians. It's okay to come to church every now and then, it's okay to pray or to a home group maybe, but what would we do if God was really asking us to do one of the big steps, to show that we put him first and foremost? And we might be much better examples than I am. I have a lot of doubts about my reaction, that it would be what it should be. Some of you, I'm sure, would exactly do what Jesus and God expected, get up and leave. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> but maybe sometimes I'm wondering if I kind of cherry pick a little bit, choose the bits of God and the bits from the Bible that I like particularly well and put aside the other bits that I don't like so much and hope that they won't come into play. And who knows, maybe Abraham was in this kind of state. So he had his son, he was happy, he didn't move around that much anymore. Maybe he got a bit complacent and maybe God needed to remind him of, look, I am first and I am above everything else. Even your son and your wife, you have to listen to me first and foremost and then care about the others. Or actually, you should trust me that I care about all the others. But this is not an easy task I find. I find this really hard to contemplate. So we might have to go back to the basics and read all the bits of the Bible and not just the bits that we like. So I'm speaking about the text that I find really difficult. Maybe Abraham gets to get the good guy because God and Abraham have a very deep relationship. They have a very long relationship. Abraham was incredibly old. God was in his life for a very long time. And God was speaking to him. God was speaking to him apparently very clearly. When God talks, Abraham listens. It sounds so easy, but it is very important, listening to what God has to say. And then Abraham did also the next step, listening alone is not enough, you also have to act and listen. So God talks to Abraham very clearly. If I was being asked to give up my family, I would want to put up a little fight, I think. And God would have to speak very clearly to me for me to even contemplate this thought. So sometimes I'm a little bit jealous when you read in the Old Testament that God is speaking so clearly to people that they know exactly what to do. It can be hard nowadays to work out what God wants us to do. And sometimes you think, oh, I worked it out. Thank you, God, and you go off. And then it turns out to be not the correct path that you have to turn back. So things might have changed for us in comparison to Abraham. But Abraham's life was permeated by very simple obedience. He listened to God and he acted on what he heard. Very straightforward. Listening and going and doing this. He trusted God. He trusted God that this was the right thing to do. He was asked to leave his home and he did. He was asked to wait for a son and he did. He didn't have much of a choice. Well, he did a bit on the side, but he didn't have much of a choice there. He was asked to sacrifice his son and he was willing to go through with it. So Abraham gets to be the good guy here because in this story we are being told how we trust the good, always, in every situation. And they make it sound so easy. In hindsight, everything is easy, but it can't have been easy right there in the presence of Abraham's life. It can't have been easy to 
follow through with all these drugs infections. Sometimes I wish you could hear what's always been clear. Some of you might have heard what's always very clear. Some might have to be more quiet to actually work out what he wants. But what I find remarkable in the story here is that Abraham doesn't seem to negotiate with God. Because if that was me, if God even clearly, if God was speaking to me very loudly and clearly about this, I would probably try to negotiate and that, well, that's all good, but didn't you think about my family and what about my son and that would be terrible for him and didn't you promise that he would be the seed of lots of nations? So what happened to this promise? How can you ask me to do these kind of things? You must be kidding me, God. Remember the plans you had promised me for Isaac. But we are not told that Abraham did this. We are told that Abraham got up and did what he was asked to do. And that's something that makes life a lot easier if we have this kind of trust. We trust that everything will be well, that everything this comes from God will work out, even though it doesn't look like it for us at this moment. It doesn't mean that life will be free of hardship, not at all. Pretty much all the stories in the Bible are full of hardship. These people, in hindsight, it all turned out well, but these people went through horrible things. And none of these things can have been easy. So at no point did God promise us a life free of hardship. But he promises us a life free of the worry about any of these daily little struggles. And they are the big struggles, but they are also the little struggles. And they can be equally demanding and soul destroying, really, in our lives. The feeling that all the responsibility rests on your shoulder. And these are little things providing food every day, cooking, picking up children, keeping the house clean, making the garden look presentable, doing stuff at church. These are all great things and all things that are not particularly hard. But if you are anything like me, then you can feel the weight of this thing on your shoulder if you take on all the responsibility for this. But God is offering us a way out. God is telling us, if you trust me, you don't need to worry about these little things. You do not have to shoulder the entire responsibility for everything. You can walk freely, upright, through your life, because if you trust me, all you have to do is listen and act. I'm really preaching for myself, as most of the time. It's always sad, not easier, but I can see the promise there, and I can see how hard I sometimes find daily life without any particular hardship in it. And yet, God is offering a way out. So how obedient would we be? Would we negotiate with God? Does this tendency to negotiate as I would look, show a lack of trust? Because if I was trusting, I would just get up and do and not try to squeeze God in between all the other little plans and ideas that I have for my life. Children live a life of trust. In most cases, I think childhood is such a, in retrospect, such a great time because we didn't have to worry about any of these little things. We totally trusted our parents to provide food, to take care of us when we are ill, to deal with all the paperwork and all these little things. Yes, they have their own worry, I don't want to downplay that, but it's different when you are an adult. So I think living the life like a child does has a lot of this trust. In it. Like children trust their parents to take care of all, of all these little things that grind us down in our daily lives. We need to have this type of relationship to God. And Jesus actually tells us so in the Old Testament that we should be like children. Maybe he was referring to trust here as well. You can interpret that in all sorts of things. I was looking for examples of people who trusted God so I can bring in some modern day counterpart to Abraham. And when you Google that, you get a lot of people who in hardship trusted God. And this is, as we've heard from Peter and John, right here this morning, these are very important examples, and it must be incredibly 
hard, yet important to trust in these situations. But it wasn't the type of example I was after, because I feel in this situation of hardship, you don't have a, an, ob an obvious choice. While in the story here, Abraham had a choice to say, look, I'm not doing this. I'm not leaving my country, I'm staying where I am, I'm not taking my son up the mountain. While in this hardship, we are already in this bad situation and we cannot, we can not really choose to get out of this situation. So I was looking for examples where people trusted in this situation. And the internet is much less full of these type of examples. And then I thought, I don't need examples. We have them right here. Many of you are an example of this simple trust in God. I'm not going to point out anybody, but I think what Peter talked about this morning was very fitting. His life, the trust, the hall, the building of the hall, which wasn't easy, but trusting in God, overcoming these obstacles. And I thought about my husband's grandmother. He mentions her quite often when we talk about these issues. She lived, I, I never met her, so I don't know her firsthandly. He probably talk about her better than me. But she lived a life, a very simple life of trust. She woke up in the morning, she thanked God that she woke up. And in the evening, she sent God for the day, and she trusted throughout her life in a very simple, obedient way that God was the one taking care of everything. And I admire that. I'm very envious of this kind of trust. And she had a difficult life. Lots of very challenging and difficult things happened in her life. But this is the kind of trust we are talking about here. Somebody is offering you to lift the weight of your shoulders. Immediately. It's a very simple childlike trust which accepts God's supremacy in our life. So probably Abraham gets to be the good guy because he had this characteristic. Because he managed to trust God very deeply in every single thing. And he didn't say, oh I know better because I still have to do this and that and I have to do the garden and the goats and I can only leave in three years from now because to tend to my elderly relative first. And the very final, very short point, maybe Abraham gets to be the good guy because he simply said, here I am, Lord. Very few words, no discussions, no ifs and buts, very simply stating, here I am, Lord. I'm ready to do what you're asking me to do. And from what we know, he actually meant it. It weren't just words said in a church setting. He said these words and God was speaking to him directly. He didn't say wait, he didn't say I just need to finish something, can you please talk to me later, I'm in the middle of something here. No, he said here I am, which means I'm ready, I'm listening, I will act on what you are telling me. And this is all we need to answer, this is all that is needed. These four words, here I am, Lord. I don't know if you sort of realized while Anne was reading the story, but this whole story is mirroring, quite obviously, the New Testament. God gave his only son, he sacrificed his only son for us on the cross. And Jesus was quite willingly saying, you will be done. Here I am, Lord. I am accepting, I'm trusting you, I'm accepting what I'm going to have to go through. And again, not an easy path that he chose to walk. So God did for us what Abraham, very nearly in the story, did for God. And now it's our turn. So why does Abraham get to be the good guy? Well, because he trusted God every single time God spoke to him. And in case I have lost you, just a very quick summary. The overwhelming message, I think, of today's reading is that we are asked to trust God very deeply and very real, above everything else, including family, money, whatever is most precious to you in your life. God has to come first. He has not promised us an easy path. If you look at the Israelites in the Bible, there are the chosen people, something that sounds so great, yet they have very different centuries, millennia, still having a very difficult, definitely not an easy path. 
But Abraham has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone of trust. And trust means accepting the simple fact that all will be well, that you are cared for with love, that the worry, all your worries, every single little and big worry, rests on somebody else's shoulder who cares for you, every single one of you. So God is saying to us, remember, I've got this. Don't you worry. But I want to finish with Abraham's response, and maybe in your heart you want to echo this and say, here I am, Lord. 